Good morning, New Life Church. Glad to, glad to see y'all brave the cold weather, and y'all are the brave ones this morning to make it out this morning. So I am Thomas Welch, and this is my wife, Susan, and we're shepherds here at New Life Church. And uh, I hope uh, when you came in this morning, you got a good warm cup of coffee and uh, some cookies. And uh, I saw a lot of you visiting out there this morning, which was a good thing. When you came in also this morning, I hope you got a Connect card. Uh, if you would, fill this out. This is how we know you were here this morning. Uh, we've also got the QR code. If you didn't get one of these, you can uh, get your phone and take a picture of that. And it'll ask you the same exact questions that are up here uh, on this uh, Connect card. Uh, the big thing though for this, not only do we know you're here, but on the back side we take prayer requests. And uh, Misha and the staff get together on Tuesday afternoon and, and pray over those. And uh, there's also a website, prayers at noonlifeodessa.org, you can email your prayer request to. So uh, you can fill this out and uh, drop it in the two boxes just on the outside of the doors out here. Um, also in those same boxes, uh, we take our tithes and offerings in those. And uh, we, we appreciate uh, the gifts that have been given to this church. It, it helps us keep the lights on and keep the heaters on and, and uh, pay the salaries and stuff. So we greatly appreciate that. There's a couple of ways to give if you don't have money with you today to uh, put in the boxes. Uh, you can see you can mail it uh, here to the church or you can text or, or you can give online. We just can't do it on the QR code yet. We're, we're not able to give on QR code, but... But these are the ways we can do that. So, um, And also, if you'll notice, right here in the middle of our uh, auditorium, uh, we have a communion table set up. and um, We'll have that set up here just a little bit later in this service. Um, it's an important part of our church service every Sunday that we uh, take time out of our, our busy day and our busy week to remember what Christ did for us on the cross and his broken body and his blood that was poured out for us. So um, they'll set that up here just in a little bit. There, there's tables on the uh, sides, or you can come down and Misha and Oksana will serve you uh, when that time comes. And um, also during that time, we'll have prayer couples on either side of the stage. If you want to come up and ask for prayer, uh, we've got some shepherds that are uh, will be praying over you and... and uh, uh, lift you up in prayer. So, Susan, what else do we got going on this week? Well, on Tuesday nights, we have a group of prayer warriors that meet at 6.30. Anyone is invited to come and meet with them. Also, Kingdom Kids is starting this Wednesday. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yay! 6.30 to 7.50. And also, our youth group will be meeting tonight from 6.30 to 8. Um, also, the... Uh, Life groups that meet up here at the church will also be starting back this Wednesday also. And then also coming up on um, January the 21st is Exploring New Life. So if you're a visitor or if it's your first time with us and you want to know more about this church, um, please get with um, Misha and Oksana. They will be having an Exploring New Life at their home um, January 21st from 530 to 8. And I know we have youth group going on tonight at 6.30 uh, till 8, so uh, we'll do our best to get over there and get the hut warmed up beforehand, and uh, Lori will be on time despite the cowboy game on, right? So, okay. Yeah, nobody talk about the cowboy game. Don't tell her the final score when she gets over there, so. All right, huh? Yeah, the bathrooms are working, and. Um, yeah, we, we've had some sewer issues over there, but I want to thank Dave, and we've got volunteers all over this church that help out, so Dave, thank you very much for helping. I don't see Jerry here this morning after Man Church last Saturday. He fired up the lawnmower, and he was out there mowing, and I know we, we've always got volunteers out here doing the cookies and the coffee and uh, passing out Connect cards and and just this church wouldn't make it without our volunteers, and we greatly appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you all. Um, now comes to one of our favorite times. Hopefully I see a handful of kids this morning. Y'all come on up, and uh, uh, we'll come meet, and uh, we'll go to class here in just a minute. Hey, Mr. Finn, how are you this morning? All right. Oh, okay. Good morning, church. 
I hope you're warmed up. I'm still freezing a little bit. You know, I'll turn 71 in April. I'm an old guy now. Uh, about as old as Adam's goat, I guess. The more I read the Bible, <clears throat> the more wisdom it imparts to me. That's what it should do. I've lived a bunch of experiences. I've lived a life. And the more <clears throat> the truth comes through. You know, Paul in 2 Corinthians talked about the wisdom of God and how the wisdom of the world is very contrary to the wisdom of God. And <clears throat> we celebrate each week. And to some people, this seems like foolishness, like folly, like, why do y'all do that? But we, as Christians, hopefully, have the wisdom to understand that this is a celebration. Yes, Jesus Christ, a sinless person, died on the cross. He brought us a new covenant. A new covenant through his broken body, represented by the bread, and his shed blood, represented by the Jews. And it's through this new covenant that what do we have? We have grace. That's all that can be said. Grace. I hope as you partake of these emblems that, yes, we're supposed to reflect upon our sins, but we're also to reflect upon this great sacrifice and this new covenant. And, and let it be a celebration, a weekly celebration that Christ died for us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you so much that your wisdom, uh, your desire to be close to us created this great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And through him we have this gift of grace. Father, help us partake of these emblems in a manner pleasing to you and that uh, we reflect upon his great sacrifice, we confess our sins, and we look upward to you. And we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the most, I guess, cold-proof people of, this, of New Life Church, uh, and visitors as well. We're, we're, we're excited that you're here. Um, I, we, may, we may need to talk, because we, uh, when we were coming, we were told that it was going to be warm. So um, I, need, I, need, I need to remember who told me that, so we can have a conversation, OK? And, uh, and some, some people asked me this morning, uh, you like, are you liking this weather? <laughs> Just because I happen to be born in uh, Siberia <laughs> doesn't mean that I love it, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the first passage we're going to look at today uh, is going to be in Second. Samuel chapter 4, so you may want to open, open it uh, while we uh, are getting there. Um, hide and seek. Uh, is, that, um, is that still, I mean, I know we played when I was a kid. Yeah? yeah. Teenagers, kids still play it? Yeah. Yes, on this side? Yeah, okay, all right, so... Um, so who used to play when you, when you were little? All right. So were you good? Were you, were you better at uh, hiding or seeking part? Hiding. What did you enjoy the most? Hiding. Who enjoyed seeking? Okay. Okay, we got a few people. All right. Um, so, okay, I just wanted 
um, if you didn't know that it was an international sport, then you, um, it is. And I want to tell you a story when I won a, I think I won a world championship in that. Um, yeah. So um, my mom, I guess when I was about five years old, uh, my mom would uh, bring me to my grandma who lived in the village. And so I stayed with my grandma. I, I, can't, I don't remember for how long, but I, it was a while. So in the summer, I was with my grandma. And so one day, uh, she, she had to go to work, and she told me, stay at the house and uh, don't leave the house. Don't go anywhere, okay, while I go, uh, while I'm gone. So she left, and little kid, you know, I was... I was I was bored pretty soon, pretty fast, so uh, I, I tried doing different things, and then I thought, well, I'll just surprise her, and so I hid, I hid behind that couch, so my thought was, when she comes back, I'll just, ta-da, you know, kind of, so I'll, I'll let her look for me for a little bit, but then I'll just do the uh, performance and appearance, okay, so... And so I hid, I sit, I sit behind the couch. The problem was that I didn't know when she was coming back. Uh, and so I guess I got tired and I fell asleep. So the next part is what I, what I was told what was happening, okay? Because the, uh, the next thing that I remember was like, you, you wake up and she's... Very emotional, okay? <clears throat> so, obviously what happened was she came home. She was trying to find me. She's like, where are you? Where are you? I can't find you. You're not. In, and I wasn't anywhere. So she couldn't find me. So her thought was, well, he left the house and went somewhere. So she went trying to find me. And that's, that's a village. I mean, that's, you know, you have some neighbors. She was started running around asking neighbors if... If uh, I was over at their house or uh, I wasn't anywhere in anybody's house, obviously. <laughs> uh, so she started running around and asking other people if, she, if they saw me. And somebody told her that I saw a kid who was walking down to the river. And it's a, it was a steep hill going down to that river. So she, she ran there. She was looking for me everywhere. She couldn't find me. I cannot imagine right now what was going on through her mind, okay? All kinds of possibilities and things that could have happened. So eventually, she, I guess she, all she could do is come back into the house, and while I was asleep, I guess I moved, and I think my foot kind of stuck out, from, out uh, from behind the couch. And she walked in, and she's like, oh, wait, we got somebody here. So um, I think she was really happy to find me. I mean, I, I cannot imagine. I'm kind of, can, you be, can you imagine you know, being a grandparent? Last time I talked about grandparenting, right, and your grandkids, and you're entrusted with these little treasures, and, and then, you know, like, I'm trying to put myself in that situation. I'm thinking, well, what am I going to tell my daughter when she finds out something happened? And searching during those days was different, right? I mean, teenagers, this was a pre-cell phone times. <laughs> I mean, they probably in that village, they had the one stationary phone maybe at the post office. That's, that's all. So it was like running around and looking and asking people face to face, okay? So... That's how I won my world championship. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> hiding as a game is one thing. When you're hiding um, to save your life is a totally different thing. And that's a, that's a classical plot for movies and books, right? You know, that suspen suspense, that scene when somebody's uh, chasing another person and uh, the person is running into a warehouse or a storage, you know, and they're just... Every time when I watch that, that, those parts, I'm like, how, did, how do you select a place, a spot to, to hide, okay? I mean, there's all kinds of places, and you have, you have very little time to do that. And the music is intense. 
and the guy is with a gun, you know, looking for you, and he's ready to kill you. So that's it's a, just the classics, you know. It's like they're looking for you. You're hiding. So, um, well, today uh, we're going to look at the story of a person who had... Um, he was hiding for many years. He had to hide for many years. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing story. I love it. Uh, and I hope that God will show us some things through that story. Um, so just to give you some historical background. So we're, uh, Saul, King Saul, was the first king that, was, uh, the, that Israel got. So they were unhappy being led by God through the prophets. So they said, we need a king. We want to be like every other country around us. And he said, okay, I'll give you a king. So Saul became the first king. But Saul... Um, how do I say this? He, um, he, loved, he loved the royal office more than he loved God, I guess. Uh, he had a bad heart. He, did, he disobeyed God, and God rejected him. He said, the next, I have another person. I have selected, chosen another person, and that person was David. But it took a while, you know. It, didn't, it wasn't like a one-day switch. So David had to run and hide. But we're not going to talk about David today. Um, we'll, this is where we will get to the, uh, our, our passage today, 2 Samuel chapter 4, and we'll read verse 4, just to kind of bring us into the story. Now, this is what it says. Uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel, that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she heard away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. So that's kind of the, the setting of the story. So Saul, King Saul had a son named Jonathan, and Jonathan had a son whose name was Mephibosheth. Um, and so... Mephibosheth is our character for today. I mean, actually, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty cool name uh, for a kid if, if somebody's planning to have a kid. <laughs> Who knows, maybe in a, few, in a couple of years we'll have a little Mephibosheth <laughs> running around here. Or maybe some of your friends are thinking about a name for a kid. So just this free idea. To you. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's try to imagine what his life was like when he was little. He was just five years old when that happened. But before that, life was pretty good. I mean, you're a grandson of a king of the country. So you obviously live in the palace. And anything your heart desires, anything you want, you got it. All you need to do is just ask for it. You want, you want a Barney? You go. You want a PlayStation? Perfect. Easy. Not a problem. Uh, you want a sports car? Here you go, just a little one, okay? Well, until you grow up. So, and so he lives as a grandchild, right? We talked last time. We talked about how much we love our grandchildren. Uh, so you're a grandson of a king. So he's got all this love. He's just bathing and swimming in this love, and he's also a future king. So after his grandpa. Uh, his dad is going to become a king, and then it's going to be his turn. So life is pretty good. Future is bright, right? So everything is good. What could go wrong? When everything changes in one moment. Everything changes. They get terrible news, and in one day, Mephibosheth loses his grandfather and his dad. In one day. They die in battle. Um, and so what used to happen in those times when a new king comes or maybe a current king is overthrown, the new guy comes in and wipes out the whole family. Anybody who could claim uh, to be a king or has the rights or maybe he's an heir uh, and he has rights to become king, they would wipe out the whole families. All the kids, everybody, yeah, they're little and innocent and cute, but when they grow up, so we better take care of this now. That's what used to happen a lot. 
And so this is the reason why Mephibosheth's nurse, <clears throat> I said it, Mephibosheth's nurse, <laughs> when she heard about the death of Saul and Jonathan, that's why she grabbed him and hurried away. I don't know what happened, how she dropped him, that he was crippled uh, for the rest of his life, but it happened. We don't know the details. But so when they get the news, chances of him being killed were pretty high. And so as a result, he becomes crippled. It's kind of happens a lot in our lives, you know, things change in the moment. Things go really well, life is br- uh, future is bright, life is good, and then you get a phone call, you get a text, and your heart sinks. You get the news, and uh, life is not going to be the same anymore. It, it changes. Everything changes for good. And so it was the same thing for Mephibosheth. The drastic change of life happened when he turned when he was five years old. And so from that time on, he had to hide. He lived in a remote place, the town called Lodabar. Uh, and that place is barely ever mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and in Hebrew, Lodabar means no pasture, no thing. So um, it's not a complimentary name. For a town, just just imagine. I mean, I, I don't know who picks out names for towns and cities, but you can imagine several guys just standing around, like, "What are we going to call this thing? Call call this place? Uh, no pasture, no thing, kind of like nothing. There's nothing here. Um, nothingville, right? Um, so, no pastures meant no crops, no cattle." I mean, I, didn't, I don't even know what people did there. Uh, so, and that's the place where he ends up and he lives there and he grows up and many years go, uh, go by. So he, he, I'm sure he had, he had to live in fear. Because even though he, they managed to take him away and hide him, I mean, how do you know they're not going to go out and start searching and how do you know that they're not going to find you and then kill you? So it's just it's a, something you, you would not envy, uh, something you, the lifestyle that we would not want to do. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe right now things are okay, nobody's looking for me, but who knows what the next person who comes to power is going to do. I don't know. I'm still going to be hiding for the rest of my life. What if they remember about me? What if they start actively searching for me? And this day actually happened. This day came when they remembered about Mephibosheth. And so this is where we go to, the ch- to chapter 9 in 2 Samuel. And we'll read um, verses 1 through 11. We'll, we'll just stop in some spots. So one day... David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? This is what he's talking about. When Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, and David, they were really good friends. They were really close friends. Jonathan's dad, Saul, he he didn't like David that much. He saw him as a threat. He saw him as the next person that could become king. So he was trying to get rid of him. He was trying to kill him. David had to hide as well for many years. But him and Jonathan, they had very close friendship. And so Jonathan, when he realized that God chose David to be the next king, he asked him to promise him that he will take care of his family. That he will protect his family. And David made that promise. And this is what he's talking about here. He says, is there anybody alive uh, in Saul's family that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Because I made that promise to Jonathan. So many years go by, and David wants to keep his promise. 
the promise that he made to Jonathan. So verse 2, he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Here's where your heart sinks, right? The king summons you. It's a big deal. You show up before the king, and he's like, are you Ziba? Yeah. <laughs> is it going to be, what kind of news is it going to be? Bad news, good news? I don't know. I'm kind of anxious. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive in Saul's family? Okay, here's where Ziba goes, whew, at least it's not about me. But the question is kind of, you don't know how to take it. Is anyone still alive in Saul's family? He knew what the cultural thing was. He didn't know what to expect from David. And David, then David continues, If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Zeba replied, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. In Lodabar, Zeba told him. At the home of my maker, son of Amiel, we got a lot of names, okay, today. So just if you're thinking of names for kids or grandkids, maybe, just throw them in there and write them down. Um, so David sent for him and brought him for maker's home, from, from maker's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Okay, here's where we need to stop and kind of think what Mephibosheth was going through. For many years, he's an adult. He's got a family now. Uh, so he's lived there in that no nothingville, in the middle of nowhere place. And that day comes, people from the king, the messengers from the king, or maybe the soldiers from the king, come and say, we're taking you to the king's palace. The king wants to see you. And I doubt they gave him the good news. They just said, we're, you know, even if he asked, do you know why? Well, we were just told to bring you in. So... He probably was not expecting anything good. He could know, there was no way that he could know about David's promise to Jonathan. Nobody knew. The only person that was alive that knew about the promise that David gave to Jonathan was David. Jonathan was dead. Nobody else knew. And that's another thing that talks, speaks about David's character. Nobody else knew but he knew that he gave that promise, and he had to be faithful to it, and he had to keep it. So Mephibosheth is coming in, and he's thinking, big life changes again. And most likely, it's not, they're not going to be good ones. I'm probably nearing the end of my life. The changes about to happen were, actually were very big, but they were not as bad uh, and unpleasant as Mephibosheth thought. There were actually some wonderful changes about to happen. So verse 7, we continue. David says, don't be afraid. I mean, he wouldn't say that if he didn't see Mephibosheth being scared to death, right? Why, would he, why else would he say that? He says, do not be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. That's a turn of events. You're coming in expecting to be dead in a few hours or minutes, and you're hearing that you're going to be given a lot of land and you, begin, you are going to be eating at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? An incredible relief. The weight gets off his shoulders. Am I, I mean, are you saying I'm not being killed today? 
Are you saying you're going to reward me? I mean, whoa, thank you. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba, the guy that he was talking in the very beginning of the passage, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him, to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, just a footnote for us. Uh, and Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table, and listen to this, like one of the king's own sons. You know what's amazing? The amazing thing is that Mephibosheth had been hiding for so many years thinking it was a better thing for him and safer. He was thinking that hiding from the king was a better thing, a better choice, and a safer choice for him. But he finds out that all these years he had been hiding from the mercy and the blessings of the king. He could have had all those things for all those years. They were available. He just didn't know. And he could be eating at the king's table and be wealthy all those years. You know, I think each one of us spends some time in Lodabar, in that middle of nowhere place, hiding from the king. Some spent more time, some spent less time. We thought, and we were hiding from God, running away from God, because we thought that God despised us, that he just wanted to hurt us, that we thought that God wanted to take something good from us. He wanted to put some limitations into our life, um, and that all God wanted to do, as we thought, was we thought that he, he just wanted to punish us and send us to hell. And so we see that incredible and unbelievable blessings are being poured on this man, Mephibosheth. All of Saul's property was given to him. How much is that? I do not know, but knowing that Saul was a king, I would imagine it was a lot. That was a lot of property. And the guy, like, the, the guy that... Uh, Nobody cared for, nobody cared about. In one minute, he becomes one of the wealthiest people in the country with servants around him. They're taking care of all his things and take care. They work on his land and all he can do is just enjoy life now and eat at the king's table like one of king's own sons. He probably thought, whoa, they should have found me much earlier than now. I could have used that. This is an amazing story of friendship, of faithfulness to the promises, keeping the word, the story of mercy, and drastic changes in life. Um, did you know that you have a, a, one more name, except for the ones that you have in your birth certificate or driver's license. Your name, another name of yours, is Mephibosheth. Because this story is about each one of us, really. Why? Because without God and because without His Son, uh, we were... We lived a terrible life. We, were, we lived a crippled life. Uh, we, we were limited in so many ways. Um, we, we didn't have God, and we did not have his blessings. We, uh, we were dependent uh, 
on so many things. We just didn't know God's mercy. We didn't know God's love. We could not find meaning and purpose in our life aside from God. And even if we thought we were perfectly fine, we still, as the Bible says, we all fell short of God's glory. We were all separated from God and from eternal life. And just like in this story, we were called by the king. We were called by the king to come and eat at his table. And this is what, as Ross shared today, this is what we celebrate each Sunday when we take communion. This is what we remember, that God is inviting us to come and eat at his table, to come and talk to him, to come and spend time with him, to come and live in all his blessings, to come and enjoy his will and the promises now and for the whole eternity. Mephibosheth received all those things not, of what, not because of what he had done, but because of who he was. Actually, to be more exact, precise, because of whose son he was. That's why he received all those blessings. In second, uh, the last verse, when it, when it says that Mephibosheth ate at the king's table, and we're like, of course, of course he would do that for all those, for the, all those years after that. Who would, who would reject such an offer? Who would say no to an opportunity to eat at the king's table? You know what? Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we say no to that offer and to that invitation. And sometimes we're like, we come and we eat at the king's table, and then after a while we just start looking around. We're starting to, th- to say, okay, maybe they have a better menu over there. I'm kind of, I mean, <clears throat> any, when you eat at the king's table, I guess, there's all kinds of food. If, you, if you're tired of this food, all you say is that I want this, and you have that. But we're still, we're kind of, we're at the king's table, heavenly king's table, but we still often start looking around. I guess I wonder what's over there. I'm afraid I'm going to live all my life without trying that. Maybe I'm missing out on something good. Sometimes we do not come to eat at the king's table because we're just lazy. Because it takes effort. And we miss out. We miss the time at the king's table. And the king, who was so amazing, so gracious, and so wonderful in the beginning, after a while, he's not that cool anymore. He's not that loving. He's not that... I'm kind of getting used to him. I'm kind of getting used to having all those good things. So I'm starting to look around. And so if you used to be at the king's table, but maybe you have been gone a lot or skipped a lot of meals, invitations, trying out food at different tables, maybe you lost your appreciation of being invited to, to, to God's table. Well, maybe if that's your case, maybe you need to come back. Because the invitation is still there. Maybe you need to still come back and sit at the king's table. Who else is going to welcome us? Inconsistent, unfaithful, sinful. Who else will welcome us at his table and will call us chosen, royal priesthood, sons, friends, children of God? Who else besides God will do that to us? I don't know of anybody. And if you're still, maybe maybe you're you're still hiding from God in Lodabar, in that nowhere, in the middle of nowhere place, trying to hide from his mercy. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior yet, well, I beg you, let us know, because we want to tell you about how wonderful the King is. Get that Connect card, leave that information, we'll contact you. Or let us know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you. All I want to do is to tell you about that invitation that's out 
that about the king who is inviting you, wants you to be at his table. God is inviting you to sit at his table like one of his children. He wants to fill your life with blessings from him. Maybe the reason you're, you've been hiding from him and running away from him is because you thought that he's mad at you or he wants to punish you or make your life miserable. Again, if you just give us a chance to tell you, we'll share how much he loves you, how wide and how high is the love of God for you. Mephibosheth, if you have not, if you've been saying, no, I don't want to name my kid or grandkid a Mephibosheth, <laughs> it's actually a cool name. You know what it means? Uh, there are different ways of uh, translating it. One of the meanings of that name is end of shame. End of shame. That's why I think it's a cool name. Because he was, he was, he lived the story of his name, the end of shame. He lived far away. He was hiding. He was living in shame. He was hiding, probably lying about who he really was so that he would not be found and killed. But the day that the king called him, invited him to be at his table, that was the end of his shame for him. In Romans Eight, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. End of shame. That's why I said Mephibosheth is one of our other names. End of shame. If you're in Christ, there is now no condemnation, no sin that's separating you from Jesus. You're... Now you're free, you're invited, you're welcomed at the king's table. Um, I, wanted, um, I wanted to play a song for you. Uh, the, the theme of this song is from this, based on the story that we read today. And it's, uh, it's uh, one, of my, one of my favorite singers is singing that. The quality is not that good. I was recording it with my phone. Um, so... Um, I, w I want you to listen to that.
Her name is Crystal. She is uh, Randy and Sandra's daughter. Uh, they came here uh, in the summer. So, um, I just hope that it will remind all of us that we have been carried by the ta uh, to the table, the table of the Lord. We were literally carried there by Jesus Christ. We were helpless to get there ourselves just because of him just because of grace we can be at the table so let's not take this for granted the price that's been paid for us for our sin is so great so precious let's stay at the table and let's invite everybody else who we can think of let's invite to that meal, because everybody is invited. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that no matter who we are and what we've done, your invitation is still out there, still valid, still good. And you thank you, we thank you for the great mercy and grace that as deep as is the ocean and as high as the heavens. Thank you for calling us and calling us and saying we are your children. Thank you for this incredible opportunity that we've never deserved. We could never deserve. We could never do anything to get there. But you love us. You call us. And you want us to be there. Even when we run away and hide from you, you're still inviting, you're still waiting for your children to come home. Thank you for doing that. Purify our hearts from everything that's there, that's competing for our love for you. Cleanse us through your son's blood. Help us to be faithful. Help us to love you more than we love anything else in this world. I pray for the transformation of our hearts, that you will be our most valuable treasure, and that just like Mephibosheth, we would in, eat at your table as one of your children to the end of our life. And we pray all those things in Jesus' name. Amen.